Okay, today on the podcast, I'm joined by a local man, Mr. Shane O'Keefe from Kilkenny. How are you doing, sir? What's the story, man? I like the name "local man." Is I, if that's if that was my if my, that was my superhero name, that'd be pretty cool. Local, local man, man does big... podcast. <laughs> local man shouts out cloud. Yeah, for people that don't know yourself, anyway, tell us a bit about yourself, man. Yeah, as you correctly said, I'm a I'm a local man. <laughs> local to the community of Kilkenny, uh, big home bird, but um, I'm involved in um, video production and in radio. Uh, amongst trying to do other things as well. So they're, they're my two big things that I do. Um, I do video production with a group in Kilkenny known as Dice Men Productions. We've done some documentaries. We've finished a feature film that we shot just before all COVID hit. And I work with KCLR on their sports team. The sports team assemble kind of anchorman style. But yeah, I, I'm a presenter at the weekends for, for KCLR. So. That's me, in a nutshell. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the work you do with Dice Men and what your role is in it. Uh, yeah, so Dice Men kind of came about when I used to make these little crappy comedy stuff on my phone and uh, under the name Simple Crack. And I, I was only doing that to meet other people who had an interest in the stuff that I was doing. So I kind of some of the videos did well, some of them were crap, and I was like, I, I didn't like, I, I don't like doing this very Irish specific humor stuff, you know? Just been like, no, oh, this is what your Irish mammy would do. Or, I, 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 that wasn't for me. So I met some uh, guys, and we ultimately became Dice Man Productions. And I have a dark sense of humor, they had a dark sense of humor. So we we're kind of making these weird, dark little sketches. Most of them would never be seen, but I had a lot more fun. <laughs> Doing those little dark sketches, then that no one would see, then chasing likes and, and stuff and views on, on Facebook. So I kind of put a bullet in the head of Simple Crack and went with Dice Men. We started this, we weren't initially Dice Men, we were just lads messing about. And then we were like, we could actually make some money out of this. And started investing in equipment because what we found when we were doing these little sketches were we liked setting up stuff to look a certain way. and mechanics of the camera and stuff and we just started going we can make a business out of this and invested heavily into different cameras different equipment lights sound gear over the past few years and we're just we're like we should do a music video so we shot a music video for king kong company and we should do a documentary so we did our very first documentary it was a feature length on uh, over the top wrestling and their last night in the tivoli theater we should do a short movie so we did that and we got to go to some film festivals. And we should do a comedy night. And we did a comedy night in Kilkenny during the Cat's Laugh uh, with Owen Colgan. I think you had him on your, your show before. Yeah, and then I've done it a was, night with Owen as well. well. We'll talk about that in a while. <laughs> yeah. And then it was, uh, we, we started working on a, an Australian cartoon called Mining Boom, which is, which is pretty big in Australia. It's pretty big on YouTube. And from there, the guy that writes Mining Boom was like, we should do a movie. A full feature length and we were like okay i guess we should do a movie so then we shot a movie and for the past year now we've been in in the trenches with that thing trying to you know sort out all the post-production stuff on it which funny enough like pre pre-production was was about a month and a half the actual shoot was about a month and now like post-production has been like a year you know just trying to sort everything out and stuff so that's what they spend though um, do commercial work, but we mostly just do the commercial stuff to fund our own little fun projects that we want to do. And obviously, with the pandemic kicking in, it's obviously affected you guys. And you know, like you, you said, you're off air that you were still kind of busy, like. But obviously, the doors are not open for every type of entertainment at the moment to be recorded and stuff. So, do you find that you have less work, or do you find that we we've, we've, we've kept consistent? We've kept really consistent with work. The problem is that a lot of companies aren't open, so why are they? Why would they ever not to advertise? You know. Yeah. So we we've come across some really cool opportunities, and we've tried to change some of our business practices and offer kind of more of a virtual thing as well. So we're kept busy. Like the lads, the lads will be working on tomorrow on a project, and we managed to fit in a short movie as well during that time. So when the ease, when the restrictions ease up. Uh, 
quite a bit last September, I'd say it was. So we've been pretty flat out with all these people, different things going virtual. We were able to kind of do stuff in that vein. But uh, yeah, it's, it hasn't been the same, obviously. But um, you get these kind of cool opportunities then a few times a month, and you're like, awesome, that's pretty cool. But from a point of view of us all getting together and shooting and doing what we love to do and make funny sketches and stuff together, no, we have we haven't really got to do that part of the short movie. But I, I I put that down to like uh, working on the feature length stuff. So hopefully within the next few months we'll have some really good news and positive news in regards to that. The documentary that you guys made on OTT, like I've seen it and it's. Uh received like many great reviews how did it feel to record that last night there yeah it was pretty awesome like i'm like none of the boys that are in iceman like wrestling and they're constantly been like why the fuck are <laughs> why do we find ourselves in so many different kind of weird wrestling centric things um i, I was like no this would be really cool and i got to joe cabre who's the ott owner i was just like hey um I was actually watching some YouTube documentaries on wrestling on like uh, CZW, Cage of Death stuff. And uh, I watched an ICW one that uh, the BBC done, McGrado. And I was like, we could do something like that. Mm -hmm. And we have something like this in, in Ireland. We have OTT. They're epic. So we were like, we're looking to make a documentary. We've never made a documentary. Instead of making a five minute documentary, why don't we just make an hour long documentary? And they were like, yeah, okay. So gone to OTT. Actually, we went up filming, uh, we were filming at Al Foran up in Dublin. And then from there, we had to go and meet Joe Cabre. And we were late because we, we're from Kilkenny, like we're caught in Dublin rush hour traffic. Yeah. I'm snapping in them. I hate driving anywhere. I absolutely hate it. As I'm caught in Dublin traffic, I have the owner of OCT waiting for me in Grafton Street. I have, I'm on the keys. I don't know which way is one way. Where, where am I going to park? Then a yeah. parking there's like 14 euro for like two hours. You're like, oh, yeah. what is going on? I want to, I want to go back to Kenny. But we met Joe. We gave him our idea, and uh, like the good, great thing about OTT is that you're able to supplement the sh footage that you got in the day with the footage that they shoot, uh, yeah. which, is, which is always awesome. It looks amazing. They have great photographers. Um, so they had a whole backlog of, of, of stuff that we could kind of pick and choose from so and we wanted to bring this story to life. hopefully people that didn't like wrestling like the lads who worked on the documentary other than me would, would come away from from it with a new kind of respect but i think that's happened like we it did really well at festivals it played in um we played in uh, various festivals in the uk in america in holland and then it won the best documentary at the underground film festival in, in dublin so that was pretty cool it's a nice feather to the road it was a shame to see that venue go like you know all these venues seem to be going and fucking hotels seem to be going up and that's what's going to be there i think it's either a hotel or an apartment yeah man it's it's it like i, I was only talking about this with someone recently um where kenny used to have this venue called the zoo nightclub yes uh, been the there zoo many nightclub. you were there many with uh you, you had gavin mcguire on from mike gus mike gus yeah like i i used to that, that was an event going to see mike gus fight yeah. I played there a few times with the band that I had at the time. It was just an amazing different, an amazing kind of hub of creativity. But that venue's gone. And we're losing all these little venues. And there is, in the documentary we highlight, there is a bit of a venue crisis going. Like, either have somewhere that's really big and really large, or somewhere that's tiny, that's not sufficient for, for what you need it for. There's no these medium-sized things. And, if you look at Wayne's World, like if you build it, they will come. You will have a successful venue. It's just, I, I, I don't know. Maybe we're lo we're losing a touch of that, and that's probably why you see a lot of singer songwriters around nowadays, as opposed to having an actual band. Because bands, unless you're a cover band or a wedding band or something, you're not going to get paid to play. You're not going to have a venue to play. Or be able to have somewhere to build up an audience to play. So, yeah, you've got to be very established know. now in that game. Yeah, and, like and even I'm, and even I'm, a lot of guys in that game are steering away from pubs and into the weddings. That's where the real money is, you know. Yeah, like there's some amazing. Uh, I can. There's an amazing drummer from from Kiketi. He's living in Australia, Colin Dowden, and he's making big money he's doing wedding. But he's one of the best drummers you'll ever see. Like he when he plays on his own, he's up on YouTube. Colin Dowden drums, and 
it's amazing. It's great. And then he, he was doing some side projects, but like the money wasn't there, I'd say, for him to be able to just start his own band. You know what I mean? There's nowhere for them to really play, especially in Kenny. And yeah. I don't know. It, it's a real worry for me. Is the zoo a gym now, or was it a gym for a while? Uh, no, it's a casino now. Um, Fuck. Yeah. That's <laughs> a pretty small casino. Since. Yeah, I, I, I have never been in it. I've never been in it. Um, but, yeah, it, it kind of sucks to, to see it, or not having those spaces anymore. Like, we do have clears and in Kenny, and we do have rhymes and and the set and stuff, but they're, they're all varying in size, you know. Yeah, and this very was a real rock stuff, venue, right? though. Yeah, you know, you walked out. It was like the Tivoli, you know. You're kind of going underground, you know. You're uh, with with the zoo. You are literally going all the, down these steps, and you're going into a bit of a dungeon. And with OTT, you kind of walk down that aluminium stuff or whatever the steel thing, and you're walking, and you go down into you know, yeah. the, where the ring is. And I don't know, you've kind of had this grungy kind of counterculture feel. And it was something that we wanted to capture in the documentary. And we're looking into doing something on the zoo as well. Um, I work in radio, so hopefully to do something radio-wise, uh, maybe a radio documentary on the zoo. But yeah, these things, uh, it, it sucks that they're not there anymore. And hopefully OTT will be able to come out with this pandemic and and be able to have a place secured for themselves to be able to put on shows. I remember before the zoo gigs, we'd get a bottle of Jaeger and go up to the castle park and drink it off and then go down. <laughs> yeah. I was about 14, 15, so I won't say what I did at the time. Yeah. yeah. Nothing <laughs> of the sort. Nothing of the sort. Never. Yeah. Nothing like what I'm doing right now. So you had Mr. Mr. Owen Colgan down there for the cat's laughs, and I had him for a Crash Bandicoot night, actually, in Dublin. How, how did you get on with those two nights down there? Yeah, it was great. We messaged Owen... Um, a while back just to see if he, he actually the first thing i did with own he brought me up to dublin to uh shoot something where i'd ask people directions and then freeze and those people that stare at me and we did a video on that and it just looked really strange and weird but yeah he messaged me and asked me to go up and try it out and it was cool getting to meet him. i was like i fucking love the hardy books you know mm -hmm. this is on colgan and then i think i messaged him about coming down to to Kenny and shooting some things and he, if he was interested we'd be loving to work with him and then uh, we kind of had a bit of a business relationship there and we were thinking I, I, I got really mad looking at the cat laughs and not seeing any people from Kenny involved even though like I I wasn't a stand up or anything I've done stand up before I wasn't mad that I wasn't involved and I didn't imply to be involved but Kenny has a really yeah. cool history of, 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 of or has some really nice good comedians you know and it would have been nice to we don't have a comedy club here, so it'd be nice to see someone like Michael Rice, who's an amazing comedian, who's been in Chicago, been in Edinburgh, been in uh, Perth over in Australia. He's in Barcelona now. He's done stuff in the UK and up in Dublin. You know, I don't know if he applied to be in it, but you know, he was someone that's he's busted his ass to, to, for his trade. So we were like, wouldn't it be cool to have like a headliner like on Colgan and then kind of maybe supplemented with a, with a, a Kilkenny artist in there, so um, we got we got Michael Rice. Uh, he emceed the night. There was a, a guy called Neen Nugent. He's the alter ego ego of another person. I won't say who. Maybe you might want me to say his name, but Neen yeah. Nugent is an incredibly awkwardly funny person. And then French Toast and Owen came down, and we saw we sold out the two nights. Uh, it was a pretty surreal, awesome experience. Um, just promoting the gig is it's a stressful thing. Um, I've Especially never because you were kind of you were kind of up against the machine, kind of doing that one as well, you know. Yeah, like I think we went, we clashed with like Tommy Tiernan, our gig. Um, but we wanted, like, we did some sh like really weird kind of Owen Colgan style videos for um, our posters look pretty cool. And Stoned Crow, Stoned Crow, yeah. Owen Colgan, that was brilliant. Stoned, with his head photoshopped on Stone yeah. Cold in Boston. Yeah, that, that was my idea. Um, yeah. But yeah, it went it went down really well. Like we did like a poster run, printed up a load of posters. We got people in town handing out flyers, like throwing them at people and shit. Uh, we had like two two uh, valets for the night, and they were dressed in Diceman Productions gear. And, you know, yeah, it was pretty. And then like even from picking the music to go on before the acts come on and stuff. You know what I mean? We were really being meticulous with that, and that's the stuff. Entrance music. 
Yeah, but what I hate it then, no, not even entrance music, it's just when you'd walk into the bar, like you'd have this immediate vibe of what we were going for, you know what I mean? So we've been playing various different uh, kind of weird rap songs and stuff, you know, so we we're trying to create an atmosphere. And I think it was a pretty surreal thing to do over the two nights. Um, would I be doing it again? I don't know. I'd love to do a wrestling night. I'd love to have a, a wrestling show um, in Kilkenny. And I probably want to bring all these things to Kilkenny because I fucking hate traveling. Mm-hmm. I hate being in a car. I hate going. I think that's why I was never going to go anywhere and stand up because I hate driving. I, mm-hmm. I got to go on stage at Baker Street with Al Foran when Al Foran did his night out there and he brought me on and to do some improv right at the end. And driving up, I had to drive up and drive back. I was like, oh, oh no, I hate driving. I wasn't like nervous about going on stage in front of the sold out Baker Street. I was yeah. I was just like, oh, fucking hate driving. I don't want to be on this M50. I don't want to be on this motorway. I just hated it. And that's why like, re- my wrestling thing never worked out. I love being there. I love being in that gym in Bray or being in the gym in Baldoyle with IWW. But I just I hate the driving. I hate the travel. It wasn't for me. And kudos to the lads that do it. And same with the stand-up thing. We don't have a scene here in Kilkenny. So that's why I'm like, yeah, let's do these nights ourselves and we'll bring all this cool stuff that we want to travel to and go to. But, you know, we're not Irish travelers. So we'll bring it all down here to us in Kilkenny. Okay, I have, I have an idea for you. Go for it. Do you remember when uh, OCT done the Father Ted night? Mm-hmm. What about... Yeah. What about, what about a crossover between your wrestling show and the Hardy Books? Hardy Bucks comedy wrestling extravaganza. You could get Seamus up against uh, fucking Eddie, Eddie Durkin. <laughs> <laughs> the battle of the of the true ginger warrior of Ireland. The true yeah, Hardy we, Buck. We'd probably have to make a few calls for that to happen, but we, we can't rule it out at the same time. Oh, you never can't say rule never. it out, man. You can't rule it out. But yeah, yeah that'd be pretty awesome. That's something I think to strive for in the future. Yeah. In terms of KCLR, then, the local radio station, what do you do on that channel? Uh, I'm the sport presenter. I work on the sports team, so we do uh, two to six every Saturday and Sunday is sport on KCLR. I kind of, I was work, I was a producer for, for a long time. I was working on guests and coming up with questions and cool little things for the show. And then during the, the lockdown and pandemic, they were kind of, you know, you don't have many people in the studio and stuff like yeah. that. And because I had the background in presenting and producing, I had had a chance to handle the show myself. So, you know, which is tough. Over, <laughs> I remember sitting in in the office one day before I became the presenter with the guy that I was presenting. I was producing, so I'd come up with his content, and I just like had lists of all the sports that were cancelled. I was like, man, we have four hours to fill, and we have no sports to talk about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's literally nothing going on. After the first you could get like twenty minutes out. Everything is cancelled. What's gonna happen? And then you're like, we have another three hours and forty minutes to fill, you know? So that was like when I became presenter, that was really challenging trying to come up with different creative ways to fill eight hours of content on a particular subject that wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. But um So what the kind of a, a, a uh, I was just trying to find kind of weird guests and guests that were, you know, involved in sports some way. And I was like, I, I interviewed Josh Prey over in America. He was the guy that uh, was talking about calling Kamogi Kamaji. He was an American guy reacting to all GEA sports and stuff. Yeah. And I was just getting these weird, cool guests. I was looking at sports recruitment in the States. Uh, um, I was looking at... And obviously hurling being very big, I was trying to get hurlers or or uh, people involved in Carlo or Kenny GEA and so like I, I and then from there then I started being able to come up with a plan in my head of, of what the sports show would need to be and what we needed to do and what people were responding to and like we started creating different podcasts offering for different things. So we, like we had the Clash Hack podcast and that's uh, interviewing different GEA personalities. And, you know, people that love GEA can can listen to the Clash Act podcast. And, you know, we do the Football Manager Football Show, which is people who love Football Manager. I, I, I play that out and we do a podcast on that. And 
I don't know, they, just different weird, different things that we're, we're trying to come up with because obviously sport is coming back. So, you know, there's a lot more stuff to talk about. So the show feels fresh and vibrant. And because of that time when there wasn't anything going on, you were able to go, okay, we can, when stuff starts happening, we're going to be able to come back with a bang because we're out, we're out to teaching ourselves how to do stuff when there's nothing going on and how we can create content out of nothing. So imagine when mm -hmm. this stuff comes back, what yeah, we're going course. to be able to do. So, yeah, so um, it was a really cool learning curve. Um, it was pretty awesome. Avid Manchester United fan, I'm an Arsenal fan myself. Do you think they'll meet each other in the Europa League final? Uh, no, I hope United Emery knocks out Arsenal before that. I hope Arsenal get through and Villarreal get through and then Emery knocks out Arteta and United yeah. beat Villarreal in the final. But then again, <laughs> like I I don't care how fallen off a cliff Arsenal have been since the Invincible days. Yeah. I I, I hate them. <laughs> really? I, I really, I really okay. dis... I, I, I remember the just clashes and the battles with with Patrick Vieira, I remember uh, like Overmars and and, and Petit and Parler and and especially that defense, the Keon and the Adams. I hated that. Oh uh, yeah, I, I think hated it was watching that as it. Paul Trafford probably done that for you, Van Nistelrooy. Yeah, well, even before that, I hated mm -hmm. Sylvan Wiltor. I think they Arsenal won the the, league, the Premier though, League in Old Trafford, and I remember it, and I was like, oh, I'm sons. Of because I was a bit too young to remember the Blackburn Rovers stuff just yeah. before that. I, I think my first proper Manchester United memory was 1996 and Eric Hansen getting that goal in the FA Cup final against the Spice Boys. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, and like I've, I've always, I always kind of viewed Liverpool as a bit of a joke since then until it's like shit started getting real recently. You're like, oh crap. Um, but Arsenal were like the first team I proper disliked. Yeah. Um, then, then it started becoming like disliking Chelsea, and then disliking Man City without, without like lowering my dislike in any of the other ones. Like, it, like Arsenal didn't suddenly become this team that I had sympathy for because they weren't doing too well. I was like, if they got yeah. relegated, I'd be happy. You know? They're uh, United are a much better team than them though at the moment. But the only thing I'd say is like the manager he needs to deliver a trophy. Like he needs to. Um, I think when he came out and said that United aren't really contenders for the league, when they were top of the league, I think mm -hmm. by three points, and I think maybe had a game in hand, and then in the space of two months to go to second place and be 17 points behind, I think that's really unforgivable. I think that's... I, I can't... I don't understand why he isn't getting more slack for yeah, he like seems to, to be getting a bit of a a bit of a free pass a lot of the time, isn't he? Yeah, to say that you're not content, but then again, I wouldn't I wouldn't blame him. Like, he was trying to take the pressure off himself as well, I'd imagine. But like when you say that, like I'm involved in, in amateur soccer. When you say stuff like that, you're fired by into it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I manage my team. If I said that, the lads would be like, piss off, I'll keep you. Know what I mean? I know it's only at <laughs> amateur level, but like yeah. Stuff like that, and then to go seventeen points behind—that's that's just really unforgivable. Yeah, City have just been different class this year, though. With Ruben Diaz, I think, really. Yeah, but they there. weren't though. Init they weren't initially. Yeah, you know they started I mean? off pretty so shaky. So that's where United could have. I don't know. They 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 seem to hit these purple patches, United, and then just fall off the cliff. For some and reason, then, I don't think I don't think we're meeting that final either. I think one like or a, both of them won't make it. Yeah, I, I have no, I have no trust in, in United to 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 easily pass anything. Like you could, you could be like, yeah, they're yeah. going to hammer Granada. They're only eighth in the league in Spain and stuff. But at the same time, they have lost to Sheffield United and drew with West Brom and thrown away leads against Everton. And you're you're just like, oh, it's mind boggling. <laughs> you see, yeah. and then win that win against Man City. Yeah. in the league and you're just like I, what's happening with this team I don't know no consistency yeah not as bad as Ireland anyway Ugh. yeah that's a that's a strange thing I do I know that you're very ardent against Stephen Kenny and stuff but I do have some yeah. sympathy for the man to be fair like it's just 
Yeah. Imagine going in there, you're picking your team. Like Colin O'Dowda and Horahan are gone now again. And uh Cleveland Kelleher's gone. You're just like, oh dude. I feel I, do you want to hug? Dude, but like me. but like eight games and one goal and no wins, like it's just I can yeah, it be that there's bad? No, there's no what would, you, what would you say there's though no if, we lost, those... if we lost to Qatar next week, what would you say? Oh, that's unforgivable. That can't happen. Mm-hmm. That can't, that that that'll be funny if it so happens. Would, would would you would you think it'd be time for him to go if they lost to Qatar? Uh, no, I think he he, he does need a, a, a proper campaign. I don't think we're going to get to the World Cup anyway. I, no matter who's in charge, mm-hmm. just looking at the players, I'm just kind of like, all right. There's no, I, as I, I said, there's no, there's no, there's no players that are playing at top clubs anymore. Like you look yeah. at Matt Doherty when he went to Tottenham, but like, that's not going very well. No. Seamus Coleman, you could say at Everton is probably the most player at the most high prolific yeah. club. You know what I mean? Conor Horahan had to drop down to the Swansea to get his games. You know, they like and a he lot was of these... well. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I was quite surprised by that. Mm-hmm. Um you're looking at these players and you're like like fucking David McGoldrick, he's at bottom play Sheffield United, he doesn't want to play Ireland anymore. <laughs> you're just kind of like what can you do and then you look at Jim Crawford and the other 21s and what was doing you know who they can call up from there but once again I know they're in like Troy Parrott you know what he hasn't really done much on, on, on his loan spell I think 11 appearances one goal yeah I think he only you scored know, was it last week or the week before yeah and like Shawnee McGuire isn't doing and another Kenny man isn't doing Brilliant for Preston. I look. I look at the bench most of the time, or I look at the side most of the time. He's on the bench. You know, Jane Collins scored for Collins scored for Luton there the other day. But once again, that's League One. I think maybe Championship. Um, is he in? But, is he in the squad? Yeah, he was. Uh, from yeah, from what I, from the last time I seen yeah. it. Yeah, Be- unless he got because, injured since. Yeah, because uh, he was asked about McGeady there the other day, and he said, "Oh well, he's not quite at the the level." You know, even he's though he's had a good season. Like, you know, 30, 35 he is like but I don't know experienced player throw him in there even but even in like, the squad yeah maybe I don't know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's easy for us to say I haven't surprised I'm surprised he hasn't tried to get Shea given they come back for, for the next few internationals or something I wouldn't be surprised to see Shane Long start now with the next match yeah like you know what happened to him no, sorry, that was Robbie Brady coming on and coming off against Burnley and stuff, you know. Hmm. Uh, Hendricks still not right in Newcastle, but Newcastle are a fucking joke of a team, you know. So I don't know. Um, I don't think the the players are there. And on the radio show, like I, I talk about quite regularly with, with people involved in the soccer, and we had an interview with the likes of Mark Ty, who wrote that book, Champagne Football, about yeah. John Delaney. And there's just, just such resentment there amongst Ireland League of Ireland supporters, Ireland national team supporters towards how the FAI has been run. And I think I was talking to someone there the other day, I did an article on it about how Brexit's gonna affect the Irish football system. Yeah. And I think it might be it might be a positive thing, not just from developing people in in the Republic and like lads staying here till they're eighteen and stuff, but it also might encourage lads to go across to Germany or Holland. Yeah. Instead of getting thrown in, instead of getting thrown into an English system where they're going to get forgotten about, they're going to learn a different style of football. You know, they could go to Germany, Holland, learn different, and that could only not to say that we don't need to invest in the in the Irish youth youth setup. But I know lads that get thrown into. I have known lads that have got thrown into that system and spit back out over in England. Yeah, you know what I mean. And they either they come back to League of Ireland and very disillusioned. Like it's very rare that you see a case like Sean and McGuire where he goes across to West Ham and then has to come back home and build up his stuff again before going back, you know. So yeah. Um it'd be it'd be interesting to see how Brexit affects it and if lads will go to the likes of a Danish club or you know, goes to like you you've seen your man, is it Louis Barry? He went from like is it West Brom over to Barcelona mm-hmm. and now he's with Aston Villa and stuff. He did that for a year. You see the likes of uh Jude Bellingham and Jane Sancho and uh, like you know they went across to Germany and they've yeah. 
even became the young, these bigger, better players. Yeah, even the young fella that's doing well for us this season, Smith Rowe, he went and played in Germany for a year there, stood to him as well. Exactly. So hopefully we might see more of that instead of lads getting kind of spit, chewed up and spit out by the system over in England. Yeah. A lot of our players over there are kind of, there's not too many of them actually playing first team football really like and that's that's a huge problem in itself oh 100 percent. well and that's why i have sympathy for stephen kenny it's very easy for people to be like putting a lap on but he's inherited a side that isn't really that good and i know it's up to him to get stuff right and i know it's up to him to get results and i don't i'm not giving them all the excuses in the world one goal is pretty unforgivable in eight matches no wins um from a lad who's having a terrible season yeah. Open Celtic, but at the same time, there, there is a bit of an excuse there. Like, is there not? You know, a lot of people. I've talked to people and they've, they've been saying he's out of his depth and stuff. But I don't know. I don't. I I, I couldn't imagine anybody else getting better out of the squad. Just wait until we lose to Qatar. <laughs> yeah, I might change my shoe then. On when I know. I, no, I don't. Up. I don't. I don't think we'll lose to Qatar. Like, I actually think we're better than what we're playing like i think but i think serbia i think that game is like our biggest game like, i think it's our most important game like because we need to take points of serbia because they're going to be hitting that second spot you know i think we can forget about that. portugal you know well that's uh, that's why i don't think we're going to get to it anyway i think we need to temper expectations uh, i remember how amazing the 2002 world cup was for me i was yeah. too young for the 94 world cup 2002 world cup i was we used to watch matches where brian cody was my sixth class teacher the kenny Hurnham manager Brilliant. We used to watch the we used to watch the matches and stuff and go mental. I remember Robbie Keane scoring. I would fall my eyes. It was it was genuinely a beautiful moment. I remember two thousand five yeah. euros, two thousand sixteen euros. I couldn't I could never get off work for for either of them. But mm. I remember that just the buzz that I created on the country and I'd love I'd love for it to happen. And I was devastated when the Euros, even some of the games were going to be played in Ireland. You know, there's a real romanticism there. It was devastating that we won't get to be part of that. But at the same time, you have to look at it and be like, you know, the, the, the players aren't there. There's no Robbie Keynes. There's no Damian Duffs. There's no Richard Dunn's. You know, there's no, yeah. no, no stale words of, of any Premier League thing really in there. Bar, like, say, Seamus Coleman or something, you know, on the upper side. But, like, Darren Randolph, maybe, he's a very decent goalkeeper. I know he doesn't get many games, like, but he's, exactly. he's a solid player. Yeah, exactly. But, like, you know, even Shea Given, he was a Premier League winner, you know? Yeah, you know what I mean. He and he was in goal for years, uh, for years. So, yeah, it's uh it, it it's going to be very tough for him. Um, and I don't I don't see how he doesn't ha already have an excuse. I think Irish fans, us as Irish fans, need to temper our expectations a bit. I know yeah. there's a lot of stuff going. Oh, you know, we're, we we seem we're always just happy to be there. Well, in this case, we kind of have to be happy. If we got to the World Cup, we'd have to be happy to be there because the current crop yes. of players just isn't sufficient. They're not getting enough regular game time at the top level clubs to be able to put mm -hmm. it up against other countries that have players that get regular game time yeah. at top level clubs. We have a history of finding a way, so hopefully that can come true again. Hopefully. Yeah, uh, yeah in 100%. Terms of I would yeah, go ahead. I wouldn't imagine there's going to be many camper vans going across the Qatar now. I can tell you that. <laughs> it's it's been played in Hungary, neutral venue. <laughs> no, but what, what I'm saying for the World Cup. Oh, for the World Cup. Oh, I thought you meant next week. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm about to go to a camper van. They're going, going to Qatar in a camper van. You technically could. Yeah, so, it would take a while. Yeah, maybe. Uh, in terms of yourself then, for the future to wrap things up like what what have you got coming up um so we have the release of the movie um we're looking forward to that we're we're constantly writing we constantly have different projects there we work on an animation called mind and boom hopefully there's going to be a feature of that coming out very soon well not very soon animation takes ages but that's in the writing stages yeah we have a few mockumentary style things we're constantly looking at different like we've done a 1970s period piece that's the movie that's coming out now and it's a drama and, you know, all our records are kind of in comedy, so we've done something that has kept us on our toes, and that's what we're going to continue to do, I think. Maybe shoot some music videos, you know, small things that we can kind of get get the feeling for again um, yeah. of, of, of filmmaking, and we have a few of those on the horizon. So, yeah, it's just 
taking the work as it comes and just trying to balance it with some fun stuff. Like we've written stage plays and we've written sketch comedies and we've written we've written pilot episodes of stuff and we've written full series of things and it's just trying to figure out what we want to do next after the movie. We'll see where the movie hits. If the movie hits, maybe something like that we've written that has loads of episodes, we'll be able to get funding for something like that. If not, we'll be able to film something a lot smaller because we have the we have that in our locker as well. So I was just seeing seeing what the lay of the land is once the movie comes out and what the reception is to that. What way is the movie coming out like? Is it digital release and what were you doing? No no idea. It's with a sales agent at the moment, so it okay. depends on, on on what they can do. You know what I mean? So yeah. um we'll, we'll we'll see there'll hopefully be a few announcements in the next next few months. Um Hopefully people will enjoy it and they'll take the time out to see it. You know, a set piece movie in 1970s Ireland is a pretty cool thing. So um, in Kilkenny as well. So hopefully, we'll, we'll fingers crossed something will come out of it. We think it will. It's looking really slick. It's looking really good. And we're looking forward to people getting to see it. Listen, man, it was great to catch up with you. Yeah, it's good fun. Hopefully we'll be able to share a point of the black stuff sometime yeah. soon uh, when the country opens up back up and we can talk about our hardy books wrestling extravaganza yes that's going to happen i think <laughs> <laughs> it has to we fought out of the ether now it has to happen yeah it's there cheers man nice one thanks very much